in a national deficit. That's their attitude. And you know what? It's business as usual in Wall Street. You think this bill that has been introduced is going to make some changes? Nonsense. They will work around that as easily as pie because there's nobody in Washington who says, I'm going to crack your knuckles. I want you to get us out of this thing. I'm not going to allow you to take deposits from American people at 1% and 2% and speculate with those deposits. We need Glass-Steagall back. We need a leadership. We need a leadership that says, this may, well, my program may not work, and if it doesn't work, we'll fix it. But we're going to make changes, and these are the changes we can make, but does not take a poll to see if it's, a, uh, if it's popular. Roosevelt never took a poll. <laughs> Bernard, let me, let me uh, try to get in a few more questions. You go to Washington, and it's dead on arrival. I've spoken to our national leadership about, I, unfortunately, I only speak of the Democrats, not the Republicans, but every one of them has said, yeah, you're talking about a capital budget. I said, yes, I'm talking about a capital budget. I'm not going to back, my, my constituencies will not back it. It's too complex. It's too hard to understand. What we do need is every business in America has a capital budget. Every state in America has a capital budget. Only the federal government doesn't have a federal, and why not? If you were the chairman of the Transportation Committee in Congress, you don't want somebody telling you what to do. You own transportation. If you're the head of the Energy Committee in Congress, you own energy. You don't want a national budget. It's a political problem. So what I'm suggesting that we get around a non-starter which is having a capital budget, and having a capital budget by having deficits. It's the only way we're going to be able to work our way out of this problem. We have a broken system. You and we have to go, I mean, there are so many good ideas out there. I'm not interested in ideas. I'm interested in getting 7 million people to work this year. If it's wrong, it'll get 4 million people to work it this year. So what? Let's try to do it. Rob? On the question of fear-mongering, uh, I think at this point we need a large number of people to validate visions, ideas that, as Bernard said, there are many good ideas and there has to be, what you might say, a coalition of leading people pushing for those ideas that appeal to a broad spectrum of America because they see how they win in the picture. The second thing has more to do with what I'll call messaging tactics and techniques. If one watches the BBC documentary that's in four parts by Adam Curtis, you can find it online at like Google Video, it's called The Century of the Self. It's about the use of psychological messaging techniques, media techniques of repetition, simple talking points and so forth. Unfortunately, the far right has done a much better job in that regard than progressives have. There, people are convinced, not necessarily by the imagination of the idea, but by the repetition and by the notion that it seems to come from multiple places. On the right, they do a very good job of appearing like 40 independent voices agree to the same thing. They're all sharing the same talking points. But I do believe that the process of messaging, what you might call the psychology of marketing, is something that needs to be Im improved so that good ideas become more convincing and address the problems of real people. Finally, I think we need probably a constitutional amendment in the aftermath of the Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission campaign, which changes the role of money relative to people and votes in our society and decision making. Otherwise, we won't have a great deal of credibility uh, with anything we try to do. Ben, question and some final <coughs> comments? Um, the, uh, just to, to, to really under, underscore the point, um, you asked a question about uh, public housing projects, that kind of stuff. Here's the, the question is, where do solutions come from? Where do real solutions in our country come from? And uh, President Obama, when he was a candidate, said, change comes to D.C., not from D.C. And I think that's just as true now. Uh, we have places like Cleveland, Ohio, where people have 
finally gotten together. You had labor unions fighting and the, the crime off the charts and nobody working together. They got together, they said, we're gonna, we're gonna create real green solutions here. They involved the public housing projects folks, but they also involved the business community, Chamber of Commerce, the local banks, a huge local foundation, and they're bringing that city back. There's, there's some federal dollars there, but not a lot. Um, and yet the example of that city uh, finally coming together and solving its problems in the midst of all this stuff is gonna be, be, begin to spread. So I think what we've got to understand is there's, there's a, uh, uh, a relationship. Uh, I think we do this president a huge disservice. I, I work for him. I know what it's like to be in the White House when you are the center of everybody's communications act. It's white noise at the end of the day. The whole world telling you what you should do, what you should think, why didn't you say this, why didn't you say that. It, it just becomes white noise. Uh, what cuts through are actual success stories. Act, people actually implementing these values at city and state level so the president has something to point to and build off of. And we have the ability to do that right now. We can't write speeches for the president. Uh, we, we spend too much time talking about what the president should do and what the president should say. He's one person. Uh, but we can do, have tremendous positive impact at the local level and begin to once again aggregate all of those hopes and all of, all of those energies that then let the political leadership actually do the right thing. Thank you, Van. One quick point on the consumption binge. I've got to make this. I'd be very careful about talking about a consumption binge in America. The middle three quintiles in America did not increase their consumption levels over pre previous periods. The pe in an age of low wages and no wage increases, people borrowed to keep their heads above water, to get decent education, to make sure they could pay health care bills, to pay the extra cost because their spouses went, had to go to work. Uh, that's, I'm taking a moderator's prerogative in making that final point. Thank you all for your patience. Thank the panel very much. The Roosevelt Institute has partnered with the uh, Guildhall organization, and uh, this Hamptons Institute is the uh, result of that. And I'm with Andrew Rich, who's the president of the Roosevelt Institute. And uh, this has been uh, some heady week weekend of, of seminars. No, it's been a phenomenal weekend. You know, we um, had this phenomenal opportunity to partner with Guildhall to bring to the Hamptons a discussion of ideas, some of the major policy debates of this moment, and frankly, some of the debates around sort of how our politics should look as we go forward. And for us, it's been a great opportunity. The concept, Andrew, there, there have been different institutes. Everyone knows of the Aspen Institute and these other think tanks, but this is a seminar that brings some of the greatest minds in the world of arts, business, uh, communications, uh, if I'm leaving out anything. Politics. Politics, and politics exactly. And education, yeah. No, it's, it, you know, it's modeled in some ways after the Aspen Ideas Festival, which is a seven or eight day festival out in Aspen, Colorado. But it's one that is designed really especially for the Hamptons in two respects. One, it's taking advantage of a lot of the talent that is actually out here during the summer. You know, I mean, an awful lot of the panelists um, are people who spend their summers here. They're here to relax, to enjoy one another. But they, in fact, are people with enormous um, intellect. And it's wonderful to bring them together for this community to have an exchange of ideas. And that makes it different from Aspen. Um, and then second, this partnership is, is with us at the Roosevelt Institute. And the Roosevelt Institute's we're the nonprofit partner to the FDR Presidential Library up in Hyde Park, New York. And we're devoted to carrying forward the spirit and the values that Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt brought to this country. And we believe that one way to do that is to encourage a debate of ideas and to bring thought leaders together for that purpose. And so, again, this has been as good an environment for that as we could have hoped It's interesting. For. Eleanor Roosevelt was a reporter. Yes. And FDR, known for his fireside chats, which brought politics, government, to the people's living rooms, you're an extension of all of that. No, I think that's exactly right. I mean, I, they believe, you know, and the Roosevelt administration back in the 30s during the Depression, a period not, you know, a little worse than perhaps today, but where we were experiencing economic downturn, depression, fear, and concern um, was one where he actually created the first brain trust and he brought a lot of thought leaders together and he got people with diverse points of view to debate ideas in front of him and in the administration in order for him to figure out the way forward for this country and for the world. And um, again, I think that's really very much a model for what this can be. This was the first opportunity we had to do it. Um, 
but we hope to make it something we do on a regular basis. I think this community responded well to it and, uh, um, and is ready made for it. Well, so. we're looking forward to uh, the Roosevelt Institute partnering with the Guildhall for, for years to come and for this, this to extend for ven very many uh, years to come. Yes. One question, these are very difficult times in terms of the economy and when you talk of FDR, he led us through the Great Depression and all of those were the, the worst of times. Uh, are you hopeful about where we're uh, where we're going as a as a country and as a nation? Yeah, I am hopeful. I mean, you know, we as a people are a very resilient population. We are an enormously inclusive population, um, but we're at a point where I think we have lost sight of what the proper balance between a thriving democracy and a thriving economy where that balance is, you know, and we, um, and I think we're coming to terms with that right now. We're coming to terms with what it would mean for our democracy to be a bit more vibrant. And by that, making government a bit more vibrant and doing good, the good work for the American people that frankly we saw a function of the New Deal back during the Roosevelt presidency. And um, I think there's an awful lot of people discouraged right now about where are the jobs going to come from? How are they going to hold on to their homes? The conversations we've had over the course of this weekend, I think, um, suggest that there's there's hope, there's optimism, but it's going to take serious leadership and it's going to take um, making some people probably a little angry along the way and getting th through some, some fights and some difficult conversations. I think the country is up for it and um, I think it's going to be what we can look forward to for the, about the next year. If our viewers are interested in knowing more about the Roosevelt Institute, how can they uh, find out? We'd love for them to come to find out more about us. We're based in New York City, offices in Washington and up in Hyde Park, and our, our website address is www.rooseveltinstitute.org. Look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you so much. Thank you.